everyone. My name is Dr. Brian Thatcher, and welcome to Mercy Unbound. It's a series that aims to provide hope, an avenue for healing, and one that will help you understand and then live the great mercy of God. With me today, I have two special guests, one you have seen previously, Patty Armstrong McGuire, and we have a new friend, Roxanne Beauclair Salonon, and uh, they're going to talk about their book, uh, which is so practical, so relevant to today. Uh, every family's impacted. What would Monica do? Consolation, hope, and inspiration in the spirit of those bearing the cross of a loved one who is away from the faith. Ladies, if you would have told me 20, 30 years ago, Brian, you're going to have three of your children and are not going to go to Catholic church on Sunday, I would have probably passed out. Um, it's, it's just, it's a time we live in and uh, this book is so relevant. So today uh, we're going to talk about what would Monica do? What's your story? What led you to write the book? And uh, why don't you go ahead and start? It's a great idea for a book. How come you two wrote this book? Um, because we wanted a book like this to read. <laughs> Brian, I was right with you. No way would I be in this situation. And I felt I plugged in all the holes. We homeschooled for 19 years. Then my kids went to a Catholic school. Um, and not only did they know their faith, they embraced it. Sometimes they went over and above anything I suggested. I was really feeling, and even, so when they, they all left home, very strong in their faith. And some stayed that way for a long time. Some are still practicing the faith and some are not. And with 10 kids, I had a lot of moving targets. And so Roxanne and I became acquainted because we were both mentioned in the same Mother's Day article as Catholic writers. So Roxanne reached out to me and we thought we should meet. I'm in Bismarck, she's in Fargo. Her mother lives in Bismarck, actually goes to the same parish I do. So a friendship formed and over the years, we shared a lot and our prayer intentions became similar in that we were praying for kids who had left the faith. And so we always, we began talking about, wouldn't it be fun for us to work on a writing project? And Roxanne came to me one day and said, you know, Patty, I think she introduced the idea for a book like this. And my first response was, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm going to wait until everybody's back. And then I'm going to write the happy ending story. But through the process of writing the book, I realized a couple things. One, that was prideful. I was going to wait and I could tell everybody else, this is what worked for me. This is what you need to do. And instead, what we've learned is that we just need to surrender our kids to God, that we thought we could control things and we really can't. The only thing we control is our own faith. So it's an invitation to go deeper in our own faith. And Roxanne, I'll let you come in on that too. Yeah, it, it was uh, a friendship that developed in large part either over the phone or at the golf course near Patty's house where we would walk when I would come and visit or, or, or sometimes we would go out for tea or coffee and, and share our, you know, share our joys too. But also this, this theme of our children leaving the faith that was the very thing that we wanted more than anything was to lead our children to God in the Catholic church. You know, we had our own wandering years in our questioning years in our young adulthood, like most people do, and trying to, you know, figure things out and make the faith our own. My husband is a convert, so he wasn't Catholic when we married. And I was maybe a little less confident than Patty in terms of it wasn't that I didn't think that they would all stay Catholic, but I dearly hoped that they would. But a lot of our family's Protestant. So I guess I knew from the beginning that it could be a challenge that they would be surrounded by different ways of thinking. And, and um, so anyway, we just, uh, yeah, it, it, someone tapped me, someone on social media, I was in a Facebook thread and they were surprised when I mentioned kind of just subtly that one of my, that some of my kids weren't in the faith and they were shocked. And that was actually the tap. I like Patty, would have run, run from this book if I could have, <laughs> because who wants to write about something as painful as your ch children leaving the faith? Um, but at the same time, being writers, you know, and, and getting consolation from one another, I think, and also St. Monica, we realized that maybe there was something we could offer people as we were suffering the same affliction, I guess you could say, you know, we're in a veil and we're not experts telling people, if you do A, B, and C, your children will come out Catholic. 
because guess what, that, that doesn't always happen. And right now the world is very contentious. So we just wanted to sort through that and really offer hope for other parents. You know, I want to mention, uh, I failed to mention when I uh, talked about the book here, but it's available at ascensionpress.com, A-S-C-E-N-S-I-O-N press.com. You know, as I travel around the country and talk to people, probably the biggest reason people come up and say, will you pray for, it's going to be the mom saying, my daughter's left the faith, my son's left the faith, they're struggling and this and that, and it's, it's just so common. Who, though, for those that maybe don't know, who was St. Monica? Who was St. Augustine? Um, share with us a little bit of their story. St. Monica lived in the fourth century in North Africa, and um, she was married. It was a pagan culture becoming Christian at the time. And we introduce her early on in the book, and then she accompanies us throughout the book. It is not a biography, but it's very biographical in that this is written in the spirit of St. Monica. We get to know her. We get to know her son who she prayed for for 17 years and shed many tears. And he became, not only did he convert, but he became one of the um, top best known theologians in all of Christian history. His books, especially confessions um, are still in bookstores today. So when you think about her prayers and, and the reach his conversion has had, um, and she had, so she prayed for uh, St. Augustine, her son, who was quite wayward for 17 years. He went away to school. He came back with a girlfriend that he was never going to marry because of social, uh, social standards that wouldn't allow for it, a child out of wedlock, and a new age fangled religion. So that is not unlike what we're seeing in a lot of families today, a lot of situations. And so really, her life is very relevant and she gives us the example of persistence and faith and hope. She had two other children that did not leave the faith, but she went after that lost sheep relentlessly. And if it had been 18 or 19 years, she wasn't going to quit. And so we really look to her as our model, as our intercessor for all the St. Augustines all over. And we, and we have stories in the book with happy ending stories. Um, with, for instance, St. Bartolo Longo, who was, came from a Catholic family, became a Satanist and ended up a saint or Father Don Calloway that many people know who was just the, you know, really a bad boy. And you would just the worst. When I see him, I say, I really, Father, I think your story was one of the worst so that it could give hope to any parent. They couldn't say, oh no, my kid's worse than that. I don't think anybody can say that with you. <laughs> and, um, and we have his mother. I think we have the only interview ever that um, his mother, Lachita, ever gave because I interviewed her during the Amazing Grace books, which, by the way, Brian, your story is in that. Your story is in the same book as Father Brian Calloway. So you're, you guys are all in good company. Um, and so St. Monica is somebody who's so relevant today. So we really brought her into this and named the book after her. Roxanne, so many emotions goes through my mind and heart thinking of my children um, they're great kids and yet you know you feel like sometimes you want to give them a piece of filet mignon and they want to take the ring bologna and uh, <laughs> what kind of emotions have gone through yours and patty's hearts and minds as you see your kids do these things well it's a grieving you know, and that's one of the things we want to acknowledge. Uh, St. Monica, among other things, is known for her tears, as we know, and kind of being reprimanded to also to, you know, take a little bit of a different approach. It was a process that she went through to kind of let go and surrender and allow other people, the St. Ambroses in uh, St. Augustine's life to kind of take over. But the first thing I think is there's a grief. I remember being in my garage, <laughs> having a conversation on the phone probably away from the rest of my family and just sitting there staring at the wall just trying to wrap my brain around the fact that one of my children really seemed like they were leaving the faith and I just I was losing control and so and that's a big part of it you know when when our kids are little we're we're supposed to kind of control their lives like we have to make sure they don't run out into the street we have to 
be there to, to, to be the guide, gu guide rails through their life. And then when they become young adults, things kind of shift a little bit. And it can really be a kick in the stomach when the path that we thought we were laying out for them with God's help, right? Bringing him into the sacraments and all these things. It, it, it takes up so much of our lives. We want them to get to heaven more than we want them to get to Harvard. It, it's, it's, it's everything. And so to realize that, oh, the world is, is pulling them in another direction. It, it, it's a feeling of defeat. So part of this is just acknowledging the, the grief and kind of working through that. And once we can kind of do that and take an object, objective step back, and start thinking of the eternal view. That's a huge thing is just having a different perspective. But sometimes we need other people to help us. And that's one of the things that Patty and I offered each other. And I think a lot of parents and grandparents and godparents are, are trying to process through this kind of alone because it's a tender topic. It's kind of embarrassing. There's feelings of shame and guilt. Maybe we did something wrong. What did we do wrong, right? I thought I was never going to ask that question. There was a point where I'm like, I'm never going to ask the question, what did I do wrong? Because I know that there's lots of different factors. But when it came to this issue and it started happening, not with just one, but another child, I did start saying, what, what did we do wrong? Where did we go off the rails? And so this book is kind of taking a look at that and saying, okay, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of moving pieces. Let's kind of settle in here prayerfully and try to figure this out. And then what do we do after that? You know, you two, on a good day, it seems it's so difficult to raise children in today's society because they're getting hit from so many directions. And, and the stuff you read in the media, just kind of, it's mind boggling. But then you've got people, Patty, you, you mentioned uh, unyoked families in your book if you could share with us what you meant by that and then those parents maybe you said who have to go it alone it even makes it more difficult what were you referring to we covered everything uh we had brainstorming sessions with the publisher and one of the editors probably about four of them we covered everything under the sun that we could think of that would be affecting people today and one chapter is unequally yoked and because Roxanne was married to somebody who was not originally Catholic, she could especially relate to that. But we know many, many people in the media and friends whose spouse is not there with them. And that's hard to have to go it alone. So we wanted, and that's what St. Monica did. Patricius mm -hmm. was pagan. He was a womanizer. He had a bad temper. And in the end, the example and prayers of St. Monica converted him and her cantankerous mother-in-law also. So we wanna address that situation. There are many single parents out there. Um, a lot of the stories in the book reflect that. So maybe our situation isn't that, but we brought people's stories in who, who, who are dealing with that, both happy ending and ongoing stories because we're journeying together and we're walking this way together with Saint Monica, and I and I wanted to touch on when um, Roxanne mentioned Saint Ambrose. One of the ways of surrender that she learned in the process th that Saint Ambrose told her to talk less to her son about God and more to God about her son. Hmm. That we have those conversations. We have to, you know, where we are representing our faith, and then you start to realize that you you're not making these breakthroughs. What seems so obvious to you, there's walls up for them. And I've interviewed people like in St. Paul Street Evangelization and many other evangelization uh, ministries where they are having trouble convincing their own family of this. And one person said to me, it, it, that's just the way it is. You know, Jesus couldn't preach when in his own hometown, they didn't listen to him because they think they already know you. They think they've heard it all. And now they're going off to hear some new message that sounds more newer and exciting, or they're throwing off the shackles of their childhood and not realizing the fullness of the faith that we want to give to them. So maybe it's not gonna be us. That's, that's part of the surrender. Just talk more to God about our children when, when that's the situation we're presented with. Roxanne, in the book, the words, the father wound is mentioned. Uh, what was that referring to? I hope you don't think as a father that we were kind of beating up on dads because we do have a quite a bit about that, but it is a true thing. Um, 
that there are a lot of people that, um, well, in our culture, right? I mean, dads and men have kind of been abrogated. Their, their duties have not been highlighted. Um, they have not been empowered to, to lead the family, to take the charge, to be the warriors that God made them to be. And I'm not even blaming them. It's, it's, there's the feminist aspect of it too that has contributed, right? It's, it's, a, it's the fallen nature that has gotten out of control where men haven't been able to, to take that lead. And so, and yet every child needs that, right? God is our father. There's a reason that we refer to God as that, even though God doesn't have a gender, doesn't have a sex, but at the same time, we need our spiritual dads to take us by the hand and lead us into life. My spiritual director recently, recently told me, it kind of put me in my place a little bit as a mom, but it was, it was truth in that he said, it's really the dads at this point in our parenting when we have young, uh, young adult children that are leading them into life and they kind of become a little bit more important at this point. Not to say moms aren't important, our, our hearts are always connected, but there's a, a very direct connection, especially with young adults, right? Because we're there when they're little and, we're, when, and our hearts are connected and we're the nurturing, relational, but at the point that they're going off into the world, they need their dads. And not everyone has had a dad to lead them aptly into the world. And you know, one of the reasons too that we bring up the, the single parenting and the unequally yoked is because it can be so daunting. It's already daunting enough to like have your kids questioning and leaving the faith, but when you don't have a partner that's with you, it can just feel like this is just too much. Like I can't do this on my own. And we don't want anyone to feel alone or that they have to give up because even if they don't have a, a father or husband in their life to kind of help be that stronghold, we have God the Father, and he is reliable, and we want to remind people of that, and one of the things that came out of this for Patty and I, the biggest takeaway and surprise actually to us was this isn't a book about our kids leaving the faith, it's about our own faith and the Father calling us closer to his heart, because at the end of the day, we're all children before God, and we all have wounds, and we all need the great healer, our Father, to, to pull us into his heart and cradle us and help us through this life that he gave us. You know, for me, I realized that the, my kids, the faith has to be their own at some point, and, and it's not mine alone. And, and, you know, you mentioned cultures, the fathers being absent. In some cultures, the grandparents uh, really are the key factors, and grandparents can play a big role, can't they? Well, I am a grandparent and yes, we play a big role. I just bought three beautifully colored, pic bright pictures, uh, children's Bibles for three of my grandchildren that I just gave them the other day. And, and I was um, talking up to my uh, daughter-in-law how we, you know, we could read those that would be good for them to bring to church. And they're just starting to come back to church. Actually, it's my future daughter-in-law. And um, I, I have a son who has a child and she has two children and um, they weren't married, but these two, it's just a beautiful relationship. And he's coming back to the church. He's planning a Catholic wedding with a favorite priest from high school. Um, and I got them these books. And I said, if we read them to them when they're sitting in church, they're going to know those stories and it's going to help keep them busy. So when they look at David and Goliath and Noah's Ark, they already know the stories. And so they can just sit quietly and enjoy them. Um, so, and we always say grace at every meal, no matter which children we're with, practicing and non-practicing, and our kids are fine with that. You know, they don't go like, oh, mom, you know, like they, re they respect that. So we have a chapter on grandparents. We have a chapter on fatherhood. We have a chapter on St. Joseph. I want to, um, to kind of dovetail in what Roxanne said, that, that we don't want anybody to despair. We're not supposed to. God tells us not to despair, and he can make up for what is lacking. And that is why we can't go, well, you know, <laughs> we're we, not, not, you know, I'm lost. I can't do it. I'm missing some important pieces. We're all missing pieces. And you know what? Even if we have all the pieces, God had all the pieces. His first children didn't listen to them, Adam and Eve, him, Adam and Eve. Um, Jesus' disciples, some of them walked away from him on the teaching of the Eucharist. They didn't, they ran away except for St. John at the foot of the cross. That um, we have priests in our diocese of Bismarck whose parents didn't even go to church themselves. 
Um, and I'm like, and they're priests now and I did everything. And what, you know, I, I kidded with one priest once when he was telling his conversion story, he was on the edge of um, atheism and his mother had become Lutheran. They had divorced his parents and his dad just was kind of a couch potato, didn't go to church. And I said, I listened to a talk like yours and I wanna say, no fair, this is no fair. And I said it kiddingly because it's not about fairness, it's about the grace of God. And I listened to Father Benedict Groeschel. He had a Sunday evening show on EWTN for many years. And the funny thing is I never once watched, but I turned it on once while I was getting ready to go somewhere and I caught five or 10 minutes of it. And he had a show, it was dedicated to um, that particular Sunday. It was on atheists and agnostics and somebody called in and they'd been praying for somebody for a long time. And they told Father, I haven't seen anything. It doesn't seem like my prayers make a bit of difference. And he said, God will administer the graces at which time they will do the greatest amount of good. And I thought, wow, what a beautiful and profound belief or, or knowledge that our prayers count every single one of them, every sacrifice, every little bit of fasting. I mean, we could go, I've talked, we talk about fasting in the book. And I know that's something that we can all do in a bigger way. And I don't mean, you know, bread and water, you know, seven days a week, but we could just like, oh, I'm going to skip the fries or I'm not going to put, use ketchup with my fries. I mean, St. Francis, um, one of the, one of the St. Francis's uh, de Sales, I believe it was, said we should never walk away from the table without having denied ourselves something. It doesn't need to be something big. What if we picked, you know, picked the piece of pizza that didn't have any pepperonis on it but <laughs> everything we're doing is going towards shore, shoring up those graces for our children and God will administer them at which point they will do the greatest amount of good you know I found myself with one of my kids uh, upset they didn't know it but I I was struggling interiorly and and I tried to sort it out and I realized I was angry at what they were doing. And I think of all the emotions that go through parents. Um, have, they, have any, either of you been angry at the whole thing ever? Or what other emotions go through your minds as you're struggling? I remember one summer when it felt like everything was falling apart and several kids seemed to just be in the world and, and, I was actually talking to Patty and I remember this on the phone and I remember thinking and maybe even saying out loud, I feel like, I feel like hell is winning. I, I feel like Satan is taking my kids from me. <laughs> so yeah, there's some anger towards the situation, but I'm also angry towards the evil one, really angry towards him for, for seeming like he's one and the world for being so vicious and so crafty that at this point at which our kids kind of have, my dad said, there's a natural rebellion, right? When kids leave the home and we were talking earlier, they have to make it their own. So, and I think in times past, there's always been this, this point at which kids need to make their life their own. That is a natural thing. God put that into our lives. But right now the culture is, is devouring them. So, there, so it's a whole different situation than it was 20, 30, 40 years ago, where they kind of had a soft landing place, they could go and wrestle with these things. But now they're being manipulated and, and pulled away from us. So my anger is more towards that. And it's hard to, you know, kind of figure out how, where to put that. Um, I think the, the other huge emotion is just, yeah, when you're when you're moving towards a certain goal and like the rug slips out from underneath you and you feel like you just fell on your face and, and you're bruised and trying to figure out what to do. I mean, just anger and frustration and despair and just, it can kind of even make you question your own faith. Because when your own prayers, your deeply held prayers of the heart aren't being answered and you feel like your child is, is, is going off into this world that's gonna eat them alive, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a feeling of, of where are you, God, right? And so our own faith can be affected as well. But again, St. Monica teaches us to stay the course. She had her own moments. She had her own despairing moments, but grace got her through each day and she kept, she was just steadfast. And we just want to encourage people to the same. And again, 
we want to kind of hold people by the hand in this book and let them know they're not alone. And then we have a Facebook group that we actually started at the beginning of the year. As we were kind of getting ready for this book to be launched, we thought, you know, why, why wait until the book comes out? You know, there's people that are hurting right now. And so, and we've been praying for them the whole time. And so we started a, a Facebook group called um, Catholic Parents, What Would Monica Do? And so we are really finding it um, to be a very humbling uh, group for us, just the people that are pouring their hearts out. We just feel so gratified that we've given them that place to, to, to pray for each other and to share our hearts with each other because that's part of what God wants to do, I think, is just bring us together. You know, when I think of Augustine, and here he is a saint, help me out with the incident in the book, but didn't he really deceive Monica and tell uh, her on one occasion he's going to meet me at the dock or something? And he, he was, share that with us, if you would. Yes, he, um, she loved to pray. So we know she prayed all the time, and he said, oh, mother, um, the ship has been delayed. There's a church, you know, close by. You can go and pray and wait. Well, while she was praying, he left on the ship to Italy. And um, she ended up following him <laughs> at, a, at a later date. But can imagine her despair when she goes to the dock and she realizes the ship has left with, with her son and her grandson and the woman that you know he was living with all those years so would there be anger would there be despair in any of us but i i want to um also talk about that that anger that despair and forgiveness those are three chapters that we've done addressing that and an, uh, an important thing that we have to realize with anger is um, I quoted Monsignor Rossetti, who I've interviewed many times. I've interviewed a lot of exorcists. So we have a whole chapter on spiritual warfare because um, I've learned a lot over the years from exorcists and how we have authority and how what we can do to protect our children and um, to do our best to work with God to bring them back. Um, but anger is a very dangerous emotion. And it, it may not just be anger because they love the faith, but with that comes differences of opinions, many differences. And because we want to bring them back and it's the kid's nature to break away. And, you know, I'm, they know their own mind. They have their own free will. So sometimes there's conflict. So we may need to ask their forgiveness. Maybe we need to forgive them whether or not they ever apologize for things they've said and done. Forgiveness is important because it's empowering. It undoes what the devil wanted to do, the destruction he wanted to do because Monsignor Rossetti had explained in his book, Diary of an American Exorcist, that during an, one of his exorcisms, um, there was a, a, a small woman who, you know, they have a lot of times superhuman weight or strength when they're possessed. And she does something to hurt his arm. And he felt a flash of anger, even though nobody in the room would have noticed it, but he felt that flash of anger at her. And he realized all of a sudden what he was doing wasn't having any results. He wasn't being effective. So he excused himself with the other priest. He said, just a minute, because um, he had a prayer team and he had another priest present. He went to confession and came back and he confessed the, his anger. And now he was able to once again have an effect and have results. So we have to realize the danger of anger. And we talk about, well, what do we do with it? You know, it's there. And one of the things I do is to pray, even though it might feel like you have cement in your mouth <laughs> because you're so angry, do it anyway and unite yourself to the will of God. You know he doesn't want you to be angry. You know you want he wants you to forgive. So do that. And maybe you could think of your child as a, as a baby, as a toddler and how much you love them and some happy moments. So replace that anger with love and pray for them and then take that pain and offer it back to them. We have another chapter called um, It's Not All Bad, and that the pain that maybe we're experiencing can be a gift to them. Um, we talk about Jeff Cavins wrote a book on suffering and, and how he said, don't even waste the low level suffering that we often think about, oh, I have cancer. I can offer that up. You can offer up making a wrong turn somewhere. You can offer up the smallest of things, stubbing your toe. Don't waste any of it. And that is the supernatural power that we understand as Catholics is offering things up. It, and it um, 
increases our prayers because we're uniting ourselves to the suffering of Jesus. And our salvation was won through his suffering. So even the smallest things, our inconveniences, offer up every moment of our day in union with the Blessed Mother. Um, and so we, so whatever is causing us grief or pain becomes an empowerment so completely defeating the desire of Satan because what he intended for harm, we're going to turn into good. You know, Roxanne, behind me is this image of divine mercy and Jesus, one of the words, Jesus, I trust in you inscribed below it. As humans, we're going to fall. We're going to get these feelings of lack of forgiveness or anger or discouragement, anxiety, whatever. But at the end of the day, isn't it all about trusting in the Lord and turning this over? And, you know, I have a daughter. I, I found total peace for me with her when I gave it her back to the Blessed Mother. Um, isn't that the only way we can really get through all this and relying on the saints and our Catholic faith. Yes, yes. And we have so many resources at our disposal, but yes, a huge theme in our book is the surrender, surrender prayer. A divine mercy comes into that too. All of that fits together. Patty had introduced me to the surrender novena and we both have a, of a huge uh, a devotion to that as well as the divine mercy. But um, the other part of that too is we have to have, mercy for ourselves in all of this as well. We have to uh, know that God isn't wanting us to suffer, but allowing us to come closer to him in our suffering. But um, I, I just think, yes, all of the saints, uh, St. Saint Monica, the Surrender Novena, the Divine Mercy. Uh, the thing is, when we gave our children to the Lord in, in the sacraments, right, in baptism, when we handed them over and lifted them up to him, he took them and we're, we're putting them in his safe hands. And I think sometimes we forget that there's invisible workings of God. We just see the outside. We cannot see the souls of our children. We cannot see how God is penetrating their souls. We cannot see how God is accompanying them each day. And so for us to begin to sort of at least imagine that and to trust that, because he didn't give our kids back to us. He didn't say when we gave them to him in, in baptism and in the confirmation, he didn't say, um, well, I'll, I'll journey with them for a little bit and then I'm just gonna, you know, let them go. He's still with them. You know, if they're baptized, they are sealed with Christ forever. We're talking eternity here, right? And so we need to, at some point, trust that too, especially as we lose the control and we have to let go now it's all of the spiritual resources that, and, and the seeds that we planted. Like, yes, maybe we made some mistakes, but guess what? We did a lot of good things too. And, and, and they're going to remember that. That's in the soil of, our, of their lives. But even more than that, God is there and they are his before they're ours. And so there's a lot of trust and trust can be hard. And so we're kind of back, back to how do, we, how do we trust more? And sometimes we need each other for that. And we need, um, we just need a, a bigger faith. Again, this is calling us to a bigger, wider, deeper faith with God. You know, uh, Patty, a hundred years ago, the 12 step program was developed and the kind of motto one day at a time. But before that, a few hundred years before that, Father Jean-Pierre Cassad had talked about the sacrament of the moment. What was he referring to there and how can we apply that in our own lives? Well, every moment is a gift. And so whatever we're going through, sometimes do you ever wake up and say, oh my gosh, the world is going crazy. What am I doing here? What are we doing here? God put us here. <laughs> he put us in this place in this time, give us these children and these circumstances. And there's a holiness to that. And, and there's a gift to that, even during our difficulties, um, like we had just talked about, that we can offer that as a gift to our children. To, you know, we can we can put it in union with Jesus and with our prayer intentions, um, and and to also celebrate the goodness around us that maybe we might be despairing or well, we're tempted to despair. We want to pull back and try not to do that. That's why we have a chapter. Worry is not a prayer. <laughs> it might feel like it. It's like, no, no, no. You know, just sitting there worrying is not accomplishing anything. 
Um, I had a Monsignor Asapo I mentioned, who was an exorcist in Scranton, Pennsylvania. I was doing some work with him and I explained to him, well, you know, I just want to let you know, full disclosure, I have two kids that are an atheist and one is not anymore, but kind of new agey, you know, so he, he came to realizing there's a God, but he's not, <laughs> he's kind of still, still got a lot, a lot of, on his journey left. But anyways, he said, wait a minute. And, and I believe he can read souls. And he's told me, I asked him and he said, yes. And he met Padre Pio and Padre Pio was a spiritual father of his. And I said, well, my son, I have a son in Guatemala. Um, he loves to serve the poor, but he's an atheist. And he said, no, he's not. He thinks it's him, but it's Jesus in him. And he's living off the fat of his Catholic faith. And I thought, wow, isn't that beautiful that we raised them with the Catholic faith and that is part of who they are and that didn't go away. Mm -hmm. And so um, we can't feel like every moment is wasted now. And although I do apologize to God and the Blessed Mother sometimes for anything, any mistakes I've made um, and anything that is wasting our time um, because time not spent in union with God is um, wasted time. It doesn't mean we have to all be kneeling in prayer. 24 seven, that's not possible. But as long as we're living our life in union with God and walking closely with him, like I mentioned in my book that we talked about, Holy Hacks, Everyday Ways to Live Your Faith, um, that we just need to be in union with God. And in that way, we are there, every moment is a sacrament. You know, I think of the scripture it talks about, you know, worry is useless and anxiety is useless. And, and this last um, weekend, I we buried a very dear friend of mine and um, time goes by so fast. And Father Walter Sisek, who was imprisoned by the Soviets for so many years, I, I cannot imagine the trials, the, the sufferings of that guy, but he hmm. said he survived by giving every moment back to God. That's, that's tough, isn't it? Uh, his story. I, I don't read books twice generally, but I, might be on the third reading of that book. I, I read it again during when the COVID pandemic was happening and um, I had read it before that, but um, his testimony really, really has touched me. Um, just that, and he struggled mightily and almost almost lost, right? He was in a fierce, fierce battle when he was in the gulags and in Russia and he had been you know, misunderstood and taken to be a spy when he was, no, he was a young, American priest that wanted to help people and the journey he went on where he had to go into hiding and he would pop up and the faith of the people who weren't even it wasn't even legal to to have religion and they would still be popping up everywhere and I remember thinking this could be us someday you know and, and it's kind of starting to to turn turn around into that but so he's a great model of just through any tu tumult you know you just continue to to just stay close to the Lord and, and trust but one of the things I was thinking too, as Patty was talking earlier, um, and this is something that's kind of come to me recently. I was thinking about it like last week, but what I realized is it was a surprise to us when our kids started, some of our kids started leaving the faith, um, but it wasn't a surprise to God. And I, I just think, you know, he, when you were talking about Patty, about us being placed here in this time and place, and, and I just had a thought that wow, God knew that this was going to happen. Like, this wasn't a shock to him when our kids started having these big questions. It wasn't a shock to him how the world was going to be at this time and place. And I, and I think that maybe he allowed extra graces so that when we were raising them and having this desire to bring them into this beautiful Catholic faith, he was putting that there too and allowing those graces for this time, knowing that they were going to need those graces for this time when they were going to be tempted. And so I don't know, it just put it back into perspective of, okay, this is, this has been hard. This has been a suffering, but like God knew this was going to happen and, and he prepared us for it and he's preparing our children for it through us. So it just, it's a solace again, kind of back to that, that idea that God is everywhere and he's in, in our lives at every moment and every moment, even the hard ones, are, are working for the good of him. But just that, it's just such a comfort to me to know that God, and just to, to, to remember that God knew it was going to happen. God knew what was going to happen this 
very day. He knew we were going to be talking to you today about this topic. <laughs> so he had prepared the way in advance. And I think we can trust in that too and just draw solace from it. Well, your book recently out, What Would Monica Do? Uh, really consolation, hope, inspiration, and the spirit of St. Monica for those bearing the cross of a loved one who have, have left the faith. Before we wrap up today's show, I'd just like each of you to share with me any closing thoughts. Um, the final thoughts is that we're not alone. We do journey together. And that is part of the beauty of the church is that we're united worldwide. You know, the, the nice, the, the creed, you know, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We have so many tools. Um, I, funny thing, I had a conversation with, um, my son, who's kind of new age now, and uh, he's visiting. He's going to be leaving for Guatemala tomorrow. And um, I talk about surrender. Like he, lo he looked at the book and he said, oh, you call it a cross. And like, you guys are victimizing yourselves. <laughs> I, I knew if of, of all my 10 kids, he was the one that was going to pick up the book and look at it. And I said, well, it's because we have, we, we have the fullness of faith. Because he says, oh, you think you have all the answers. Yes, we do, because we do believe in our faith. And so we believe we have the fullness and we just want to give that to our children and our loved ones. Um, it doesn't mean we think we're better than everybody else. It's just that we want to give everything that we can to our children. And so we go through the book with that understanding. Um, and, and, and it's really ultimately about going deeper in our own faith and finding comfort and hope in that and not despairing. Um, and so that we can find joy alongside the grief, we should be feeling a peace and joy at the same time. So we're not walking around with sad faces because right. there's nothing attractive about that. Yeah. Well, we don't know the end of the story, do we? Right. Uh, Roxanne, right. any closing thoughts? I, you know, I think Patty kind of kind of grabbed my thought about always wanting people to have hope. But another thought is we can feel confident in our own hope and continue to grow our own relationship with God. We don't have to compromise. We can still be ourselves. My, my kids, uh, you know, again, some of them are in, some of them are out, but when it's come to like birthdays or, or different special events, they get me uh, Catholic t-shirts and cups and mugs and soap. And, you know, they know who we are. And I, I believe that they draw comfort from our faith, even if at this point, they're not able to accept it for whatever reason themselves. They know who we are. They know that we love them. And I think maybe that's my final message is it has to come back to love and the relationship that we have with them. It's not about winning an argument anymore. It's about modeling our faith to them and loving them, not in a way that we're compromising our faith or compromising with the culture, but in a way that we, um, they are assured of our love. And through that, we believe that we will bring them to God's heart, but it's not through division or you know, lack of mercy or love. And that's so important because God is love. And if we want them to love God, we have to emanate that love from our hearts. Well, Patty and Roxanne, I want to thank you so much today for joining me on Mercy Unbound. People get this book available at ascensionpress.com. What would Monica do? It's a great book. It's going to touch your hearts and hopefully guide you as you have to resolve these issues within your own heart and mind and body and soul of how are you going to deal with your children but i think both of all of us would say we got to love them to pieces and uh never give up keep the faith so thank you again for joining me on mercy unbound people i hope you enjoyed this show subscribe um, tell your friends about it and uh, let's spread the mercy of god to everyone we see thank you so much for joining me and god bless please subscribe to our youtube channel for the video portion the podcast can be heard at anchor.fm slash dr brian b r y a n thatcher t h a t c h e r and on all the major podcast forums i would love to speak at your church or conference and please consider supporting our efforts to spread the truth to a hurting world thank you again and for more information go to the website at drbrianthatcher.com